welcome everyone to the Sustainable Lifestyles Leaders uh, series. I'm Vanessa Timmer and I'm the Executive Director of One Earth. And today I have the great pleasure of uh, speaking with Bernard Combs, who's a Program Specialist at UNESCO. And he's the lead on coordinating the implementation of UNESCO's Education for Sustainable Development for 2030 Priority Actions on local level actions and accelerating those, and also in empowering and mobilizing youth to foster local networks and, and platforms for intergenerational uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration and, um, and linking that to community planning and decision-making processes. Uh, Bernard is also working to reinforce a cooperation across other agencies, so with UNESCO and other agencies and stakeholders in communication, education, and public awareness in the areas of biodiversity, water, oceans, cities, and sustainable lifestyles. And so speaking of sustainable lifestyles and education, Bernard, welcome. And also in a couple of sentences, what do, drew you to the sustainable lifestyles and education work? Well, it, it came as I transitioned into uh, working on education for sustainability. Before I worked for UNESCO programs on early childhood family programs and children's rights. And when I moved into sustainability, I picked up some files on a project called Youth Exchange, uh, working with young people. It was a joint UNESCO UNEP project working with young people on lifestyles issues. So that's how I kind of got into it. <laughs> So there then, was, it was kind of like a transition to the sustainability group and then this project that yes. started to get into it. And so you were speaking about some of the other uh, programs that you were working with before. Could you speak a bit about how you your career has evolved? So how have you channeled your kind of interest, perhaps generally in education or in other aspects of the work you do now? You know, how did you, you maybe tell us a bit about how you got started and, and where you are now? Well, how I got started... Actually, I was going to become a vet. I did. I went to do three, two years of pre-vet and then said five more years of that. No, so I transitioned into biology and ecology and looking at possibly working with national parks. And then I moved into more development issues. Um, uh, and from that, uh, when I was finishing my master's program, I was looking for an internship because we could do a kind of a hands-on master's thesis, which brought me into contact with UNESCO and OECD. And there I basically became an intern, <laughs> like the cohort here, to work on database of NGOs working in developing countries on various issues, various development issues. And from that, I also wrote computer manuals for a while to explain to uh, people how to use computers, but then thought I can use these techniques on more interesting things, which brought me into uh, working for UNESCO's early childhood and family programs, and then transitioning to sustainability, which when I did that, I was very happy because then I could uh, reconnect with my working on ecology and nature and biodiversity and making those links between people and nature, which led to uh, realizing that basically lifestyles and our, our everyday ways of doing things are clearly connected to uh, how sustainable or how green our organizations, ourselves and our societies are. So that's, I basically came, let's say into sustainability in part through the uh, kind of information mapping area but also the developing uh, learning materials and also training component. And the training component also involved working with young people. Um, I was the adult volunteer with the US Girl Scouts here in the Paris area for more than 12 years, uh, working on uh, connecting them to nature and making them realize that uh, you can take daily steps to become more sustainable and practice sustainability in your own home. So that's kind of uh, <laughs> an evolution. So the career path is not a straightforward path. <laughs> if you want to, it's like sailing, you know, when you sail, you have a real sailboat, you can <laughs> move along from one, uh, one angle to another to keep uh, having the wind behind you. Um, oh, that's, that's wonderful. So that's a, 
that definitely um, is, is such an interesting path also from going from your obviously love of animals uh, th straight through the work in parks and then applying your computer skills to uh, to the sustainability of our everyday lives and the kinds of ways that we can we can live our everyday lives in a way that is connected to nature uh, and and I think because we're also engaging today with the contributor cohort, uh, that engagement with youth, of course, is really interesting to us as well. And um, so I just wondered if you could speak a little bit about uh, UNESCO itself and the work that you've been doing. And I know you've got a few slides that you wanted to share with us about how UNESCO has been connecting with the, the area of sustainable lifestyles and education. And um, yeah, so maybe share with us a little bit about that story about yeah. what you've been what you've been working on around. What we've that. been working on. Yes. Let me share my screen. So yes, uh, the work we've been doing at UNESCO is in is in part uh, connecting people. Oh, so we we're, we're working basically on the five P's of the preamble of uh, Agenda Twenty Thirty Three people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnerships. That's kind of our guiding principles and basically the interaction and the interconnection between all these five elements, I would say is at the core of uh, lifestyles and livelihoods. And in particular, this is because within the SDG, the SDG package, we have SDG four, which is on quality education and Within that SDG, there's a target, which is target 4.7, which is kind of the um, whole purpose <laughs> target, because it's about uh, ensuring that learners acquire knowledge and skills to promote sustainable development, including, of course, through education, but also through education on sustainable lifestyles, on human rights, on gender, on culture of peace, on global citizenship, on cultural diversity. So um, it's clearly part of what we have to do. And culture should not be taken as, you know, as movies and, and theaters and museums. The culture is also, you know, what who we are and who we are as communities. So we had this uh, world conference with the Berlin Declaration, with, which covered quite a few things, yeah, as you can see from this uh, uh, infographic, with the key, one of the key elements was making environmental and climate action core elements. And then you, and especially encouraging environment and education ministries or organizations to work together and move things forward. We also, um, work a lot uh, on this issue of partnership. We cannot do things alone. We have to do them together with other organizations, other UN organizations, other NGOs, other, other universities, people. And we need to have an interaction on um, moving things forward. Uh, so as I mentioned, I got into sustainable lifestyle through this uh, UNESCO UNEP youth exchange initiative that lasted for about 15 years or so. Um, part of the part of that work was developing guidebooks on connecting key issues to lifestyles for young people, uh, climate and lifestyles, biodiversity and lifestyles, green skills and lifestyles. Um, we did a in particular we did a regional one focusing on Africa, looking at sustainable lifestyles and sustainable livelihoods with examples from all parts of Africa, including conflict areas and uh, the more advanced areas where a lot of tourist industry takes place. Yes. Um, that, was some, that was kind of the last major pro production from this uh, um, UNESCO UNEP joint initiative. And then we said, well, People can still use the materials, they can still be influenced by them, but we're no longer at the cutting edge in terms of engaging with young people. Uh, because um, by the time we stopped, it was, it was time that social media was popping up and uh, moving along. So uh, we decided to channel our energy slightly differently into 
in particular, the SLE program <laughs> was one of them. Um, so in terms of what UNESCO has been doing, last year we did a, a survey of a curriculum of about 100 countries around the world to see how well in environmental issues were integrated, including sustainable consumption and production. The results were pretty bad, shall I say. Um, out of 100 countries, about only 50% uh, reported uh, or mentioned climate change. Only one-fifth mentioned uh, biodiversity, and only about 6% mentioned sustainable consumption and production. So clearly, there's a lot more to be done if we want to make sure that sustainable consumption and production is integrated into education. Uh, we also carried out with uh, Education International, which is basically the network of all the teacher trade unions around the world. We did a survey, about 60,000 teachers from 140 countries responded to the survey on the question, are you ready to teach environmental sustainability in your classroom? Okay, the immediate response was yes, we are ready, but either we haven't really been trained when we were at teacher training college on issues like sustainable consumption and production. Um, we don't really have the tools or we don't have time within our busy curriculum agenda to be able to do that. Or sometimes our principal in our school is not really into you know, the idea of kind of hands-on discussion about sustainability, circular economy, and those kind of things. Our teacher, teacher feelings about the readiness so sustainable consumption, not ready, 31%, moderately ready, 31%, very ready, 39%. It's not too, too bad, but and there's that one, that 31% of not ready that uh, needs fixing, shall we say. So there again, clearly there's something that needs to be done. Uh, we need to uh, make sure that uh, sustainability and sustainable lifestyle, sustainable livelihood is part of teacher training curriculum, but also needs to be part of some of these master's degrees, bachelor's degrees that university are doing so that young people like the court here today can actually be better trained or given this, the skills or the tools or the agility to be able to juggle with sustainability issues and sustainable lifestyles. For us, education for sustainable development basically is there to help achieve all 17 of the SDGs. So we developed this uh, guidance uh, material, taking every single one of the 17 SDGs and going and listing learning objectives for each of them. So next page, you should have something about SDG 12, uh, no, I guess I didn't put it in. So for SDG 12, we've got a number of things. And then to complement that, we developed this web platform of resources for educators on every single SDG with um, resources for early childhood, primary, secondary, and then ideas for doing things in your classroom. And you should have the one, the intro part of for SDG 12. And we're currently starting to um, update, revise it, because unfortunately, web links often uh, die out after a few years. So we have to go back and uh, re or discover new materials because that's something that's also coming out. At UNESCO, the one thing that we have to remember about UNESCO um, is that we're not only education. UNESCO is also natural sciences, social sciences, um, communication, and culture. And as such, we, we look at uh, lifestyles from all these different angles. Um, and it means that we try to introduce them in a variety of programs, which Include, for example, we have a platform on cities and in, in and seeing how do you talk about lifestyles, sustainable lifestyles in the urban context, which means looking at the issues of climate, the issues of mobility, the issues of uh, urban space. Um, we also 
one of the projects we uh, we have we've been very involved with is called the UNESCO Green Citizens Platform, something that we launched uh, just before COP15 uh, COP in Paris uh, to basically showcase people doing <laughs> sustainability, <laughs> not just talking about it, actually doing it on the ground. And there are plenty of examples of sustainable lifestyles and what alternative sustainable lifestyles should be in that. Um, the next slide is highlight some. So among green citizens, you have, of course, uh, influencers. Um, but then you also have uh, these ideas of citizen-led uh, actions. So if you go on the website, you can find a, a lot of things. In terms of uh, culture, we, of course, everybody knows that UNESCO is the world heritage. Uh, it's often the first thing people say, oh, you work for world heritage. No, <laughs> but within uh, heritage, there's something called intangible cultural heritage, i.e. living heritage. These uh, ways of doing things that uh, different communities carry out, uh, which many of them are linked to lifestyles and ways of uh, adjusting, adapting to climate, to um, natural risk and, and others. You can find that there is something about SDG 12. And for instance, you have something about promoting traditional foods and safeguarding traditional foodways in Kenya. An example of something that's part of this, uh, these, this living heritage. I encourage you to go to looking into that, but warning, you can get, you can spend the whole day <laughs> looking at all these things. Um, um, we also, uh, also work on oceans. Uh, we, have, we have a program called Ocean Literacy, which is not just about, you know, the facts and figures on oceans, but it's also about everything surrounding the ocean, the jobs linked to the ocean, the, uh, the ways of uh, engaging citizens on terms of the ocean. We've also carried out a campaign for the last two years called UNESCO Trash Act Campaign, focusing on waste recycling with schools, with communities around the world. And there again, we have a great examples of people concretely doing things, you know, while including things like uh, building your school materials out of plastic bottles uh, or uh, paying for your school canteen by bringing back uh, things that need to be recycled because the school has a kind of a, a contract with a recycling company and that pays for your school meal um, and plenty of other exciting uh, things. It's also a way to give ideas to people on what, you know, what can you do? Um, so, that's that's one another inspiration that you, we are working on. We also last year because that we had our world conference um, on education for sustainable development. We launched a campaign called Learn for Our Planet and asked people to send in videos on, you know, why should we why should we learn about sustainability? Why should, and there again, plenty of very uh, exciting motivational types of things. Um, we also are, yes, there we go. That, that one you can just leave up there because that's also, it's also part of my, my message. Basically, we have to tackle uh, lifestyles, uh, consumption productions uh, from all possible angles. We have to be creative about it. Uh, we have to call in, you know, for, um, from different perspectives. Um, it's, it's not always easy to do some of these projects because we, we as a UN organization, we are basically our bosses, our country. So we, it's not always easy to explain to ministers of education why somewhere in the school program, <laughs> educational program, this would be something about lifestyles. Um, there it's, uh, because too many education systems are still very focused on you have to get good grades to move on to the next level rather than focusing on you need to provide uh, 
skills and knowledge for people to be able to adjust to this very complex and constantly changing world we are in and to be able to adjust to quickly uh, changing situation as I mean COVID showed us that uh, those who were quick to adjust to digital and online learning were able to keep uh, kids I won't say, well, quote unquote, in schools <laughs> or in learning compared to those who are not and uh, got uh, a bit lost along the way. Um, and basically our key message is we have to learn and act for our planet and for people right now. And basically stop the blah, blah and go and do things. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that. So inspiring. We'll add... Um, We'll add the links for those different uh, campaigns into the chat. And Bernard, if you have, maybe share with us one thing that's really exciting to you right now that you're working on. Um, right now, well, uh, I'm working on a number of things related to basically nature education. How do you inspire or engage people to take, take on more actions for, towards nature? So I'm working with uh, WWF, with IUCN on uh, how can we get basically the general public to uh, care and do it on a daily basis rather than just when there's a big campaign for you know, around World Environment Day or World Biodiversity Day. So there and there it's also it's to link because there are plenty of things out there. There's been plenty of campaigns it's to try and find the little elements that will get people to move and in particular at the local level. And for that, I'm, I'm working with a, basically a cluster of, within UNESCO, there's, there are a network of cities that attached to UNESCO. And one of those is called the learning cities, where uh, city governments find op uh, offer opportunities for learning on all kinds of things in all kinds of settings within the city. So to link that, with uh, green spaces uh, and uh, local agriculture, local urban agriculture. So that's my very exciting, challenging thing. <laughs> that's, and it connects very much to what you, of course, your passions that when you got started in vets and mm -hmm. parks, the work you do with scouts. So yeah, and connecting it to daily life. Um, it, and Bernard, is there one piece of advice you would have uh, for people who are just getting started I would say be be ready to be flexible, be ready to think out of the box as nothing is a straight path. Even if, you know, usually people say the quickest way to get from one point to another is the straight line, actually uh, for a career path and doesn't work. It need, you need to be able to kind of uh, navigate. Um, and you also need to kind of have an open open mind to thinking you know okay this is my passion how do I get there it sometimes means that you have to do other things before you get to that point um, like for me for two years I was basically a bilingual technical writer on uh, computer manuals for basically adapting computers coming from the US to the European situation and true, it wasn't my passion, but actually it helped me develop the skills, the technical skills, uh, both the bilingual one, but also being precise in writing documents that I could then use on more exciting stuff. So yeah, be, be flexible, uh, try things, you know, you need to try, you need to and then and it's the same thing with food, you know, sometimes you go, oh, no, I, I don't like this. You know, try it. You might like it. If you do, good. If not, you, you move on to something else. Uh, I think this, that's the thing. And, uh, and, some, and I would say the, to add to it, basically also look for potential volunteer opportunities because that can also open up uh, possibilities. Um, for instance, yeah, being in the score to help <laughs> report about what everybody is doing on sustainable lifestyles and education. It's uh, one way to see because that way you can, by being a volunteer, you can test 
if it's really something you like to do or and you can figure out what are some of your the skills that you uh, you you like and will get you further so that's my piece of advice thank you so much so bernard combs from unesco thank you so much for sharing your career path and the work unesco is doing that's so inspiring around sustainable lifestyles and education